Hello and welcome to Today I Learned Climate, the show where you learn about climate change from real experts. I'm your host, Laura Hesse Fisher from the MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative in lovely Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is the second episode in our series about energy and climate change in partnership with the MIT Energy Initiative. So if you're just joining us, check out last week's episode on the electric grid. Today, we're going to be exploring where energy comes from in the United States. We'll talk about different types of fuel and how they differ in terms of their impact on climate change and how these energy sources have changed over time. To do this, we sat down with Dr. John Riley. I'm the co-director of something called the Joint Program of the Science and Policy of Global Change, and I'm a senior lecturer in the Sloan School. Dr. Riley is an MIT economist who studies global environmental change. To begin, let's look at what our energy makeup is today in the United States. We still supply 80% of our energy needs in the U.S. with fossil energy, oil, coal, and gas. Uh, About 8% of energy needs is from nuclear and about 11% from renewables. And if we break down that renewables further, solar and wind is only providing 3% of our current energy needs. In a future episode, we're going to go into more detail about these fuel sources. But briefly, the term renewables refers to energy that's generated by sources that won't deplete. The wind won't stop blowing. The sun won't stop shining. Rivers won't stop flowing into the ocean. Conversely, fossil fuels refer to energy that's made from dinosaurs and ancient animal and plant matter that has been pressurized under the Earth's surface for millions of years. Unlike wind and solar, we will eventually run out of fossil fuels. To understand the current energy breakdown, it can be helpful to look at how we got to where we are today. I mean, you can kind of go back into England, uh, back in the pre-industrial, early industrial era. People were most relying on wood for heat, and they completely deforested Britain and had to find something else, and they dug up coal and found you could burn that. So first the world kind of moved to coal, and that was a denser form of energy. By denser form of energy, he means that if you burn the same amount of coal and wood, the coal would provide you with more energy. So this new energy source really opened up new avenues to use energy, leading us to use steam engines and other sorts of things. Without coal, it's very possible we wouldn't have had the kind of growth in our economy and quality of life that we've enjoyed for the past 150 years. There are two other kinds of fossil fuels that are important in the modern energy equation, oil and natural gas. So oil starts out as crude oil. We drill it out of the ground and then it's refined into the various products like gasoline. Uh, It may be diesel, it may be heating oil, it may be jet fuel. So that's oil. Liquid fuels have a lot of value in transportation because they're dense. You can fill up your tank and it lasts for a long time. Sometimes oil is used for electricity and heat, but mostly it's used for transportation. Even though we use the word gas to refer to fuel for our car, it's actually short for gasoline. And it is made from oil and it's a liquid. Natural gas is a completely different form of energy, though it's often found in the ground with oil. So when you drilled an oil well, you often got this gas. And that was kind of a problem because, gee whiz, you didn't really want that. You wanted the liquid oil. So oftentimes that was just vented into the atmosphere or flared off. But eventually people said, well, look, this stuff could be used as well. And so we began developing a a collection system and a distribution system that could actually use natural gas and and get it to places where it was needed rather than just waste it and vent it. And then people began discovering, well, there are actually deposits that are all natural gas or mostly natural gas. And so as that distribution system developed, we actually started looking for gas for itself. Natural gas is piped into houses for heating and cooking and is also burned in power plants to generate electricity. Up until recently, coal was our cheapest fuel for electricity because it was so abundant in the United States and the technology boom was making it easier and easier to automate coal power plants. But now coal accounts for just 13% of our primary energy consumption. And that is because of hydraulic fracturing, better known as fracking. In 2007, 2008, 
This new technological development allowed us to exploit these resources of oil and gas that otherwise were locked too tightly in rocks that we weren't able to get. Before fracking, the U.S. had to import a lot of its natural gas from elsewhere. Fracking made natural gas cheaper than coal, and this completely shifted the U.S. energy economy. Much of the last few decades in the United States, the concern was how dependent we were on energy imports. And so as late as around 2007, uh, we were importing 30% of the energy we use in the country. So we were one of the biggest importers in the world. Starting with this frack gas explosion, I guess maybe not the best (laughs) word to use with it, um, in 2007, 2008, gas became very cheap. And so we actually began crowding out coal production and using gas in the United States. As of 2018, we're almost in balance. So we're only importing 4% of our energy needs. So we're close to becoming a net energy exporter. So that's completely reversed the whole story in the U.S. It also reversed the U.S. trend in emitting CO2. Emissions started to decline. Energy use in the United States has been flat uh, since about 2007. Carbon dioxide emissions actually declined by about 12.5%. And that's because... Not only was energy use flat, but we also had the switch from coal to gas. That's because coal emits more CO2 when burned than natural gas. Burning coal emits by far the most carbon per unit of energy used. Using natural gas in its place can cut emissions by more than half. That means we could make a huge dent in carbon emissions by switching from coal to gas. And that cues up one of the big debates that's going on now among energy experts. Natural gas is cleaner than coal, but still has carbon dioxide emissions. So the challenge, the debate is, is it a bridge to a cleaner fuel or is it just a bridge to a economy heavily dependent on natural gas? (laughs) And then if we build a lot of capacity around natural gas, then all of a sudden we're locked into gas and we're not a bridge to a cleaner economy, to a clean fuel, you know, renewables, maybe nuclear power. Uh, that has no CO2 emissions, essentially no CO2 emissions with it. So the question becomes, are we really serious about meeting the targets we have? And so if you're really pushing hard to meet them and we have to get low quickly, then expanding gas capacity is investing in a bunch of stuff that's locking you in and maybe you don't want it. So that is a huge debate amongst many people. But in poor countries of the world, they're just trying to kind of get energy you know, basic energy needs of of people met. Yeah, and as these countries give their people access to electricity for the first time, the big debate is, how do we power that demand? Unfortunately, for the climate and the environment, fossil fuels still tend to be the least expensive way to produce electricity. Even as renewable costs fall, I mean, sometimes people make the mistake of saying, oh, look, renewable costs are coming down. They're going to be cheaper than fossil fuels. But fossil fuel costs keep coming down, too, because fossil fuel companies keep finding better ways to mine coal or pull oil out of the ground. You know, the fracking boom in the United States all of a sudden found this resource, which is lots of places. And so the costs have been going down rather than up. So if you're focusing on development mainly, then that is often the fuel of choice for electricity. So poor countries of the world, are they going to go through a fossil fuel phase and then produce a lot of CO2 emissions and then find out they have to move beyond that? Can we just skip it? And that is a huge challenge for our future that clean, carbon-free energy technologies need to be able to compete everywhere. In our next set of episodes, we are going to start talking about these clean energy technologies, their benefits and their challenges. We'll cover renewable energy like solar and wind, batteries and energy storage, nuclear power, energy efficiency, and the elusive nuclear fusion. We'll also talk about carbon capture and storage. This was our second episode of our Energy and Climate series. If you're eager to hear more now, you can check out the MIT Energy Initiative's Future of Energy Studies, where they do a deep dive into these technologies. They also put out a podcast where you can hear more from John Riley and Professor Noel Celine. Just search for MIT Energy Podcast or check out the links in our show notes. 
We always enjoy hearing from our listeners, so send us any questions or comments by tweeting us at TIL Climate or emailing us at TILClimate at MIT.edu, especially now as we're picking topics for season three. Today I Learned Climate, the podcast is brought to you by the MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative. Thanks to John Riley for speaking with us and thank you for listening.